name on it. Last week, my director sent out an email to you all asking for you all to email your resumes to him so that I could look over them and give you some feedback. And that also was going to help me tailor who my audience was and what I needed to talk about during the resume portion. There were only two people I did not receive a resume for, but I still made you a folder. In the event that you are one of those people and your resume is not in the folder, you can email it to me. My contact information is in the folder, and I'll go over it tonight, and I'll give it back to you tomorrow because I wanted to be sure that each of you had some type of feedback. There are a couple resumes that have no feedback on it. I don't want you to feel like I looked over it. I just didn't have any feedback to give you, so that's a good thing. Um, the way that I approached your resumes, just to tell you why everything's going around, is from a recruiter standpoint, not more so from a career counselor standpoint. The first thing I looked at was a recruiter standpoint. We'll go through all of that when I talk about the resume, but I just wanted to let you know, so if some of you get it, some may have more marks on them than others, but I looked at it from a recruiter. If you're at a career fair, <coughs> hand this to me. What are some things that are going to stand out to me? That's the way that I approach reviewing your resumes. The second approach I used was as a career counselor, working with students who have majored in actuarial science, basically just using that just to give you some feedback. If you have any questions, again, my contact information is in there, so you can you know, send me an email, and I'll be happy to explain it a little further. Okay. Um, for about the next hour and a half to two hours, we're going to talk about um, what some of you may know as an elevator pitch. I refer to it as a 30-second commercial. I like that a little bit better. And we're going to also talk about resume writing. During the resume writing portion, I'm just going to go over some things, but I do want you all to ask me questions about your specific resumes, any myths you've heard, is this true, can I do this, should I do this, types of things, because I want, you never know, your question may help everyone else in the room. So I'm an interactive presenter, so I do expect you all, you know, to ask me questions. I'm going to ask you all questions for your feedback and everything. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, I'm going to, just for a few minutes, wait till those pass around, because the very first thing we're going to do, there's a worksheet in there. It says 30-second commercial. It should be on the left side. I'm sorry? I'm developing a 30-second commercial. While those are getting passed around, um, this worksheet, um, it's called Developing a 30-Second Commercial. This is for you to take with you. Um, as a career counselor, some of the feedback I always get from students is, I'm nervous about this. I don't know what to say. How do I know that I'm saying the right thing? I don't want to come off overbearing. I don't want to seem like I brag on myself. I don't want to take too long. So I developed this worksheet just to kind of help you to develop your elevator pitch. So then that way, whenever you can memorize it, and that way you have it already with you, and you can go ahead and start practicing it for when you're ready to talk to employers. Also, this is going to help you, you know that question that you get in interviews, tell me about yourself that you can't answer, this is going to help you there as well. So your 30 second commercial is also the answer to that question. Okay, so we're going to go over that in just a little bit. Everybody have your folder? Okay. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, when do you use this? Like I said, you're going to use it during an interview to the tell me about yourself question. In professional, social, organizational meetings, this is going to be your introduction. So whenever you're in a social setting and you're talking to people, I'm not exactly sure. I'm, I'm sure you all pretty much are familiar with each other now. But whenever you're at meetings and you're meeting people that you do not know, this is going to be what you use. Because you don't want to bombard the conversation. You want to do your introduction, allow them to do theirs, and then engage in some type of conversation. You're also going to use this in career fairs. Okay. So what exactly does it do? It states the position you're seeking. So for example, if I'm doing mine and say, for example, I'm looking for a career counselor position, that's what I'm going to tell them. I'm a undergraduate student seeking a position as a career counselor with your organization. Of course, you're going to be a little bit more specific because you're going to do your research and you're going to know the actual organization of the, 
um, representative that you're speaking with. It allows you to sell your knowledge, skills, and abilities. I know oftentimes you get a little nervous about talking about yourself because you kind of feel like you're bragging, but this is exactly what you want to do. You want to sell yourself to these people. You want to give them a reason to continue talking to you. You want to emphasize your strengths and you want to be sure to personalize. By this, I mean you want to be sure to personalize it to the organization. You don't want to say something that is irrelevant to the organization that you're, of the person you're speaking to. So for example, and I'm just going to throw something out there, say you're looking for a position at Walmart, you're going to tailor it to Walmart. You're not going to say anything about Target or anything. You know, that's, that's why it's good to know missions, visions, values, things like that of organizations because you're going to tie all of this into that elevator pitch. And, you, and one way to stand out is to know something about them that you think other people are not going to know. And the best way to get that is from their website. So then that way they know that you've done your research. Okay, this is how it's structured. You want to do your introduction. You want to state your goals, your strengths and or key skills. The key word of this is relevance. Everything is relevant. You're going to hear me say that a lot today because everything has to be relevant to the field, to the position, to the organization, to the person you're speaking to. State what you're seeking in a job. You want to stay away from benefits and this does include, include pay. So you may ask yourself, so if that's what I'm looking for, what do I say? You know, are you seeking professional development opportunities? Are you seeking things that where a supervisor is going to support you in your professional development? Those types of things. You're going to get those things from the website. When you look at the core values of the organization and what they believe in for their employees, these are the types of things you're going to state right here. And how can you benefit the, the company? This is the most important part of your elevator pitch. How are you going to benefit me? If, if I hire you today, what are you, how are you going to benefit me? This cannot be any longer than, again, this whole thing is 30 seconds. So you don't want to go into a long spill about, well, I want to do this, and I feel like I have this, and I know I have this, and this is how I can benefit you. You want to be very short, sweet, and to the point. Does anybody have any questions on this so far? Okay. So on the back of that worksheet, you're going to build your commercial. So there are some questions right there. So I want you to take a few minutes, and I want you to answer those questions. I'm going to give you probably about 10 minutes to do this. And then at the bottom, it says, now write your commercial, and I want you all to do this. We're not going to go over these today, but you'll see me again tomorrow. I'm going to go... Um, over the how to maximize a career fair and we're going to practice your your commercials because that is where it's the most important okay so we have about 10 minutes and you all can work on those
time to finish if you haven't that's fine um, just do it this evening and like I said tomorrow not everyone's gonna have to do it um, I'm gonna choose who's gonna do it and um, whoever does it you'll get a little prize okay. so I'm gonna read through mine just to you know just kind of give you an idea um, I haven't done this in a really long time so I actually did the worksheet myself and I'm going to do it like I'm applying for the job I have right now. So I'm going to read through it, and that's just to give you, you know, just a little bit of idea <coughs> of how to answer the questions. Okay, answer question number one. What is your career goal? To provide training and career programming to students. What skill or strength do you have that would help you realize that goal? I currently hold a master's degree in training and development. My thesis was on career development of college students. I am currently a doctoral candidate and my d dissertation topic is career values of college students. I have the ability to recognize potential in individuals and speaking with them to help them achieve that goal. I have presentation skills and an example of that is I was an associate professor at my previous place of employment where I taught two 16 week classes on career development. What accomplishment proves you have that skill or strength? I established the steps to your career development program for my former university of employment. What are you searching for in a job? Provide innovative recruitment and career training through leverage of all forms of social media to meet the students where they are and to work in an environment that welcomes change. How can you immediately benefit a company? I have knowledge of both sides of HR, recruitment and career development and I have the ability to provide feedback in the eye of the recruitment and a career counselor. So those are the answers to my questions. So in the event that I was presenting this to someone at a career fair, in an interview, this is how it would read. My name is Rosalind Davis. I am a full-time student at Georgia State University Robinson College of Business, majoring in, they don't have my program, so I'm just gonna plug it in here, in training and development. I, in my career, I would like to become a career counselor, which, I'm sorry, excuse me. I have five years experience in higher education, which I demonstrated when I worked for Marshall University as a career development counselor. I am looking for a job where I can leverage all forms of social media to meet the students where they are, and I can be of immediate benefit to your company because I have knowledge on both sides of human resources. So that would be my commercial. Another piece of advice I want to give you is put something interesting in there as a conversation starter. Normally, my conversation starter is telling people I'm from West Virginia. But normally, people don't meet people from West Virginia, so they're like, oh my gosh, I've never met anybody from there. But kind of put something in there interesting. We have a student um, here at Georgia State who used to be a professional hockey player. That's what he says in his commercial. Just something that's they're going to remember you by because, again, we'll talk about this tomorrow, but when you're at a career fair or even in an interview, they're going to be interviewing more than one person. They're going to be talking to more than one person. So you always want to say something for them to remember you by. Also, you only have 30 seconds to make a first impression. And once they talk to you, they're going to move on. They're going to talk to someone else. But sometimes if you say something really interesting, they're going to sit there and they're going to talk to you. That's what you want. You're, you're allowed 30 seconds the employer may give you longer. So if you have something just 
I mean, just something quick. Like I said, I always say my name is Rosalind Davis. I came to Atlanta from West Virginia, and there it is for me. But like I said, we have another student who says, I came to Georgia State after ending my professional hockey career. So then at the end, they're like, oh, you played hockey? Who did you play for? How did you like it? Do you all really get paid to fight? Those types of things. And then they go into, you know, so what, what made you major in finance? Something like that. So just find something outside of the realm of career. Because if you, if you talk about, you know, I used to be an engineer, now I'm an actuarial science major, that's, uh, but it may not be interesting to that recruiter that you used to be an engineer. So kind of think of something outside of the realm of career that you would like to just throw in there just a little bit, something about yourself, but not too personal. You don't want to say anything too personal. Just something kind of interesting about yourself. Okay. Does anybody have any questions on this before we move on? Okay, we're going to talk about resume formatting. Um, stop me at any point. Ask me any questions during this that you may have so you can make notes on your resume. Or And I also provided these slides on here as well. And there are notes, areas for you to write notes. Okay, I know all of you know about resumes. Um, I'm not going to go into And I did provide a resume format in there. That is just something that we at the Robinson College of Business, we require our students to have a format and that's it. The only reason I provided that for you all is because we get a lot of compliments on it and they say that it's just really professional and the lines create a professional presence on it and that's just some feedback we got. So I just wanted to provide that to you. Okay, so what is a resume? It's a document used by job candidates to apply for a position. It's the first impression an employer has of a candidate. I know you all know this, and so I know that that gives you the idea, this is my first impression, so I'm going to cram everything onto this page. That is the biggest mistake you will ever make. You do not want to cram it onto one page because it's not easy to read. Some of you may got, got, have gotten a couple notes from me, and that may be something that I wrote on there, is try to space your information out. Because when you hand your resume to someone, they're going to scan over it. Right in front of your face, they're going to scan over it. If there's a lot of information on it, they're not going to look at it. So you don't want that. Yes, this is the first impression. You want it to be a good impression. So you want to keep everything looking professional, spaced accordingly, use the same fonts and everything throughout. But we'll go over that in just a few minutes. It should be used to showcase the it should be used to showcase the relevant knowledge and skills of a candidate. Again, the key word here is relevant. I know some of you, from looking at your resumes, do not have a lot of experience in actuarial science. There is a handout that I gave you that highlights some key skills that are needed for people that are seeking actuarial science positions. I encourage you to look through those skills. I'm going to go over that in just a minute. And just see which, ones, which skills you have. You may not have the actual actuary intern or any of the, the actual job titles that you may see on there, but you do have the skills. You're gaining knowledge in school or have gained knowledge in school. You're gaining skills through other jobs that are relevant to the field of actuarial science. I encourage you to really read through that and see exactly what skills you have and how you can display that on your resume. Okay. So we're going to start from the top of the resume and we're going to work down. Objective versus summary of qualifications. I saw some resumes with objectives, some with summary of qualifications, some with both. Both of them are correct. It's just when to use one and when to use the other. An objective should be used to state exactly what type of position you are seeking. And you always want to use an objective, excuse me, when you have a minimum when you have minimum experience in the field. Okay, so what is minimum experience? No experience. So when you have probably, I'm going to say, between zero to two years of experience, you need to use an objective. Why? Because if I look at your, at your resume as an employer and all I see is retail, restaurants, things like that, I don't know what you're looking for. So if you don't have an objective, I have <coughs> no idea what you're seeking. I can see from your degree that you're obtaining, have obtained a degree in actuarial science, but that doesn't mean you want to work in it. So be sure that if you don't have the experience that you use an objective. Ex by experience, I mean in the field of actuarial science, not in any other field. 
because as a recruiter when they look at it that's what they want to see so if you don't have it and employers know that you're not going to have it some of you you know may not have it just use an objective that's going to tell them exactly what you're looking for the summary is used to quickly identify key skills that are relevant to the field this section is called a summary of qualifications professional summary professional profile you may have seen them all different ways um, this is going to be a bulleted list not a paragraph paragraph formatted resumes and this is kind of sending me into formatting but paragraph formatted resumes will not get read I can 100% guarantee you that the reason for that is because it's hard to pick out things if you look at a paragraph formatted resume and a bulleted formatted resume if you can just think about it in your head which one would you rather look at the bulleted formatted because you can easily scan it so your summary section should just be three to five bulleted statements. These are not going to be statements like ability to learn things quickly, effective multitasker, quick learner, attention to detail. Don't put things like that. You can put them on your resume, but an employer wants to see those by way of example. So if you're going to talk about your analytical skills, which all of you are going to do because you're actuarial science majors, you want to put how you know how do you know that you have analytical skills so you can say something like apply the ability to apply analytical skills through the use of whatever or effectively use analytical skills too and these are going to be things that you know as an actuarial science major degree holder what you're going to use analytical skills to do and this is why I said identify the key skills you need if there are softwares I know you all have to take the exams and those are really good you're not going to put those there okay those are going to be in a totally different section if there's any other software anything like that that's where you're going to put that here you're going to highlight it just so they can see that you have it if you don't have anything like that leave this section out don't put it if it's not relevant so if you have ex work experience but you're just switching fields completely don't you're not going to put a summary you're going to put an objective because you don't have the information to put in a summary of qualification section now I'm also going to preface that by saying I know that all of you are from different universities and schools and you may have been told different so I'm approaching this from the way I counsel students here so if your if your school tells you something different then of course you know you want to abide by that if you're working through the Career Services Center to use their recruiters but from recruiters that recruit with us this is what they say those things they want to see them but they just want to see them in by way of example in your work experience section and in your objective don't use pronouns many of you did and you'll see a little red circle that says please remove pronouns I me, my you them it those types of things you don't want to say that that cover that language is conversational this is a professional document and you want to keep everything professional so you want to remove those okay. education the placement on the resume is important isn't important you go back and forth with that if you have experience relevant experience your education can go at the bottom if you don't it should go at the top the only reason I encourage all of you to have your education section at the top is because of your exams because many of you listed your exams under your education section because it is part of the education but if you move your education to the bottom more than likely you're going to move the exams to the bottom and I don't recommend that because it's very important to your field so I do encourage you to keep your education section at the top so that you can have your exams there but if you choose to move it to the bottom and it's okay just still highlight your exams at the top of the resume because as an actuarial student that's what they're going to look for they're going to make sure that you have passed them you're in the process of taking them when is the next one scheduled and things like that you don't want them to have to hunt through your resume for that information because they'll toss it to the side so that's that's with placement so what details should you include of course you want to include the name of the school the location the name of your degree different schools are different here it's a bachelor of business administration other schools it's a bachelor's of science so it just depends on what school you attend and again I know there's master's level students in here as well um, just be sure to include your degree and that that right there is a prime example of why you should include it so that an employer should know could know are you getting a BBA 
or are you getting a BS? Because at different schools it's different and curriculums are different. The BBA curriculum is going to be different than the BS curriculum. So you just want to, you know, let an employer know that. When you include your dates, you only want to include your graduation month and year. You don't have to include dates attended because they don't really care when you started. All they want to know is when you finished or when you're going to finish. Just put the month and the year of your graduation. <coughs> Uh, relevant coursework. Some of you had that on there, some of you didn't. So when to include it, when not to include it. When you don't have the experience, you want to include it because many employers want to know what classes you've taken so that they can know the knowledge that you have if you don't have the hands-on experience. So you can include that as a section on your resume. Also, you can, if you don't just want to simply list your relevant courses, okay, I took this class, I took this class, you can create a section called relevant, uh, or excuse me, called course experience. It's formatted exactly like a work experience section. It's just your coursework. That's your experience. So if you simply list them, the employers may or may not know exactly what that means. But if you format it like a work experience section, they can see exactly what types of knowledge that you've obtained through those classes. So that's just an option for those of you who don't have an internship or any type of experience in the field for you to just you know, format it that way. Anybody have any questions on? Uh -huh. My question is related to the <coughs> education section. Okay. You mentioned that we can put it at the bottom mm -hmm. if we have work experience. Mm -hmm. Would you consider an internship as work experience? Yes, or absolutely. An internship is work experience, yes. If, it, if, if it's related. It's if related. Mm -hmm. Is it relevant enough that you can put it before education? Or? Yeah, mm -hmm. if you want to. It's not, it doesn't matter if, it's, if your education is at the top or bottom. That's up to you. Mm -hmm. Just if you think, okay, well, my internship was only two or three months, so let me put my education first, then do that. <coughs> So it's really just up to you which do you believe is more important because of course the, the first thing an employer is going to look for in your resume is the work experience. I know we all went to school for a really long time, paid a whole lot of money for degrees, but that's the first thing they look for is the experience. Then they look for the education because if you read a job description it says you know qualifications and they always throw the degree just in there right. after you know minimum three years of work experience or whatever they're looking for so that's really going to be at your discretion whether or not you think my inter is my internship the experience i gained in my internship more important more relevant let's use it relevant instead of importance is more relevant to than my education so really up to you. Did you feel like you gained a lot of knowledge from your internship? Yes, kind of. Okay. Kind of. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> okay. So what, what font size would you suggest? Um, font size, you don't want to go any smaller than nine because it's difficult to read. And you want to also, um, on the same thing of font, you want to be sure to use a professional kind of font, which I didn't see any crazy font in your resume. So you just Times New Roman, Arial, Corey, Corey, or something like that, just something. Because not remember, not all fonts transfer to all computers. So that's always something to think about. And also be sure to use the same size font. The only things that should be bigger on your resume are your section titles and your name and that should only be one to two font sizes larger. So nothing on your resume should be larger. If you're using 12 point, then 14, 10, 12. So, and it shouldn't be any <coughs> smaller than 10. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Um, I don't see anything where like organizations that you might have been in that could contribute to any of the skills that you, that are um, associated with actuary, is it okay to put that stuff on there? You mean like or? professional association? Mm -hmm. oh, absolutely. Yes, okay. your professional association should, and you can just create a section for it. Um, you can create it under, at, at the bottom of your resume, in the middle, just however relevant you feel it is, then that's, it just goes by relevance. So you can put it, really put it anywhere. You don't want to bury it though. So don't, don't combine it with another section. If you're a member of a professional association that is relevant to your field, then you want to separate that out so that they can see that. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk about the difference between a resume and a CV and which one of the two would you prefer to use? Okay. For um, 
it's really going to depend on the culture. Um, now that I can say. In, in the American culture, a CV is mainly used when you're applying to like educational type positions. So if you were applying to, you know, like a professor or if you're applying to a, a doctoral program or something like that, you're going to want to use a CV because a CV is an extremely long document. It's a lot longer and you're going to go into a lot more detail because you're going to talk about publications, writings, and things like that in a CV. A resume is more highlighting your employment experience and that, that's the difference. So it's really going to depend on the, um, the culture of the company and, and the company, excuse me, because some, if they want a CV, they're going to tell you. Don't automatically submit a CV to an employer because it will get thrown in the trash because it's, it's a lot of information to read. When an employer wants a CV, they'll ask you for a CV. Did that answer your question? Okay. Anybody else having questions so far? Mm -hmm. What is the page limit for the resume? Okay. Page limit. You should, unless you have more than five years of experience, keep your resume to one page. I know that's like, oh my gosh, how am I going to get all this on one page? But stranger things have happened, believe me. Um, if you have to go on to another page, it should be no longer than two pages. Um, be sure, though, if you do go on to a second page, that everything on that page is relevant because your resume will get tossed. Now, different recruiters will tell you different things. They'll say, I don't care about a two-page resume, and they may not. But many recruiters will say they only want a one-page resume. So to err on the side of caution, I always tell people one page because I'm trying to get my students hired. But if you have the relevant experience and two pages is fine, just be sure to put your name and your uh, contact information on the top of a second page. Okay. Do you think that like fitting, like uh, making the one side like 10 and or fitting like using pages but like from my experiences like uh, when I use this one page I think I was getting any responses you think you're because you left things out is that yeah, why you think you yeah I mean and the fonts were like I, use, I, I was using like 10 font size mm -hmm. but when I do like two pages and mm -hmm. make like things more like reflective you know I think that's okay were you um, two questions number one when you were using the resume did you use that same resume to shoot it out to a whole bunch of different employers yeah that's your problem and I'll get to that in just a second <laughs> um, whenever you okay you're going to have more than one resume you're going to have a general resume which is going to include every single thing that you've done work education everything and then you're going to have a lot of different resumes and each of them should be tailored to every single job you're applying to that is the that is another reason why resumes don't get chosen because they and a, a recruiter can see what a general resume is because you didn't if you if you use an objective you're not using their company name or the position name in the objective that's number one that's first indication that you're submitting a general resume number two if your work experience section does not match the qualifications that they're seeking in their job description so when you say you print off a job and you're reading the minimum qualifications and preferred qualifications those skills that they list you should have those skills on your resume in some form now, I'm not expecting you to copy and paste anything but you're going to take bullet number one on their job description and you're going to say okay so what have I done in in work school whatever that matches this somewhere on your resume it has to say that and the reason for that and this could be another thing is when you submit resumes electronically you're going through a database and they're trying to pick out keywords the keywords are listed in their job descriptions so if you're submitting the exact same resume to every single job the keywords may not match up so that could it could it may not be the one to two page resume because again if you want to use a one page resume by all I mean two page resume by all means do it if you feel more comfortable doing that absolutely but that may not be your issue whether it's one page versus two pages another thing when you are using two page resumes be sure you're not repeating anything so if you have four jobs and you did something at job one and four, you don't have to list it under job one and four. List it under one or the other. Because once you have the skill, you have it. They don't care that you did it at one, two, three, and four, just as long as you've done it before. So you always check for that as well. Okay. 
Mm -hmm. I heard that uh, employ employers like um, a well-rounded person. Mm -hmm. So um, some people have advised me to just put everything, things that doesn't necessarily pertain to the job, mm -hmm. but just some skills you have. And um, I don't know what you think about it. That is true, but you don't want to crowd your resume with a lot of those things. You should, yes, they're exactly right. You should put things that are kind of outside of it, but you don't want to have three jobs on there that are totally irrelevant. You're always going to do something at some job that is not relevant to the new job you're applying to. So yeah, put some of those things on there, but don't crowd your resume because those irrelevant things can have a tendency to crowd the relevant things, especially if you don't have a lot of experience in the field. So yeah, that's okay. You just kind of want to stay, and a lot of students, the way that they do that is they include like a hobbies or interests section. You know, I tell, <laughs> believe the things I've seen, I tell students to stay away from that because students tend to get a little bit personal with that section, but some, I have seen some students, we don't, I'm not going to not approve your resume because you have it on there, but I'm going to just strongly recommend you pull it off and kind of put something else like under your work experience section to show them that you're well-rounded. Community service and volunteer work is a perfect way to show them that. That you're, because you're involved in things that are outside of just, you know, career and things that are relevant to what you're trying to get into. Any other questions so far? Mm, yes. Uh-huh. If you work for the same company, okay. and you have two different positions. Start with the most recent first, and then put the other one underneath it. And then put as a bullet that, were you promoted or did you just... When I was working as a tutor, I got it. Okay, so it was, was it a, a consider a promotion? Okay. Just put, and as a bullet, just put promoted from tutor to teaching assistant after however many months, semesters, whatever it is. That's good. You always want to show employers that you're promotable. Okay. What else? Okay. Some formatting things. Templates. Um, I did see a couple of you have templates that I think made your resumes go on to two pages. When I removed the template from your resume, it went on one page. So be careful using templates. Another thing with templates is if you have to, like you were telling me, you apply to a lot of jobs. If you just, for example, if you have your resume in a template and you need to cut and paste something really quick, you can't do it in a template because you know how templates, when you very first open it up, it's all boxes and things like that. When you copy it, it copies the box. And then if you paste it in a Word document, it's all over the place. So just be really cautious with using templates. Paragraph formatting covered that. Font margins. Always have a margin. Don't make everything stretch to the page. You know, if you have to go really small on the left and right margins, that's fine. Just be sure you at least have a top and bottom margin. One page in most cases, like I said, if you do use a two-page resume, again, which is totally up to you, you want to be sure to um, include your name and contact information and the words page two so that if, you're, if it gets separated, they know that there's a top sheet to that resume. Whenever you're using, when you use your bullets, be sure to use round bullets because not everything transfers. Dashes don't transfer, stars don't transfer, and arrows don't. So just be sure that you're using round bullets because if you use anything else, when I mean don't transfer, when you open up the document, it's all over the place because you know how bullets indent things and so it's just, it's a mess. Uh, be consistent with fonts and be sure if you do have a two-page resume, or if you have a one-page resume that you, you've done everything to shrink it onto one page, that you don't have a blank page at the end because when you electronically submit it, the blank page comes first. It doesn't come last. Okay, so your work experience section. When is it relevant? It's relevant when you're, when you're applying to a specific field and you've worked in that field. Simple as that. So how do you format your work experience section? You can, actually you can format it any way you want. Just one thing I always say, the I reads left to right. So it's always good to have your job titles on the left hand side so that they can see which ones are relevant and then have your dates on the right hand side. So just because that's the way the I reads and if they scan down, they're going to scan down the left side. They're not going to scan the right side and they're definitely not going to stand there and look to find your job titles. So just be sure you know that your job titles are always on the left hand side. 
um, how far in employment should you go back 10 years be sure not to put anything on your resume even if it's relevant further out than 10 years and what kind of information to include we've talked about that in detail you just want, always want to be sure to include anything relevant um, just to go back to what I was saying earlier about taking the job description this is the best way to assist you in writing your work experience section is get a job uh, like for those of you who are still seeking internships find an internship and I actually included a internship in the folders that I gave you just read the job description, identify the key skills, the minimum qualifications they're looking for, write down, not on your resume, just write down on a piece of paper, what do I know? What, what, how do I know if, if I want to hire you for an internship with Northwestern Mutual, what are you going to tell me, how, why should I hire you? How do I know you know it? Write that stuff down. That's the type of stuff that's going to go in your work experience section. So if you know that you, again, I'm going to go back to the analytical skills, you know that you have them, how, when did you gain them? You, when did you gain them? Same thing, I see customer service all the time, multitasking all the time, <coughs> attention to detail all the time. When did you gain these skills? Those are the types of things that are going to go in your work experience section in the bullet points. You want to stay away from responsibilities. By that I mean answer phones, file papers and you were an administrative assistant. I know that already. So you don't have to say things like that. You want to think of things that you've done, again, that match the job description or the field. If they don't, it's okay to not have bullets under your, job to, under your jobs. That's okay. If all you've done is restaurant, wait, wait tables, bartend, retail, and nothing outside, which I know there are things, because I've done them both, that you've learned, but you can't think of anything, don't put sweat floors, ring up customers, things like that. That means nothing to an employer because they can see you worked at the Gap. I know you cashed out customers, pretty much. So, you know, it's going to, the work experience section probably takes the most time on your resume, but it's very important for you to tailor it. If you don't tailor it, you're, set, you're not setting yourself apart from other people. Okay. Chronological versus functional versus both. How many of you all are familiar with a functional resume? You know what that is? Okay. Okay, so I'm going to talk about them just for those of you, because some of you do have some experience in this field, so just so you know how, when you need to use a functional resume, how to use a functional resume. Chronological is the one that starts with the most recent employer, works its way down. Functional resume is only used when you have experience that you have a lot of experience in a specific field that you want to chunk. So by that, I mean like I'll just use my profession. I have experience in training and development. That's one title. So underneath that, I'm going to put bullet points of similar like I would put under a work experience section. Bullet point. How, what have I done in training and development? So for example, develop training programs for 600 students. That's, that's one bullet. But you have titles. So instead of having work experience and then having job A, B, and C, you have functions. So you have training and development, um, employer relations. You have things like that, and you have bullets underneath them. So when you have the experience, a functional resume is a good resume to use. Just be careful with putting too many functions on a resume. You should not have more than three. So you just want to be sure that if, say for example, if you're looking at a job type, at a job description and they say, you know, the minimum qualifications are this, and you know, in my last four jobs I've done that, you can do a functional resume because that's a function. That bullet is a function and you can just put the bullet points underneath it, but you don't want to put too many bullets. You want to still stick with the whole summary of qualifications thing, three to five. You don't want to list the long laundry list. And some people use both. Some people can use a chronological and a functional, and this is going to go when you have, I'm going to say, seven to ten years of experience. You can use both because you can highlight the key functions at the top and then do the <coughs> chronological at the bottom detail in the, your dates of employment and everything. So you can Google a functional resume. A lot of employers, you know, kind of are getting away from them because they do just, with, you know, with the economy being the way it is, they want to see those dates of employment and that's fine but when you have a lot of experience in a job a functional resume is going to be the way that you want to go mm -hmm. i have a couple of questions okay the first one is about how we write either the company's name mm -hmm. or the position name which one should come first it doesn't matter 
you, you can either write the organization name and location or you can write the job title but be consistent so for example you said you have an internship if you write actuary intern on the first one but then let's say your second job is just a cashier at the gap and the first one you have actuary intern the name of the company the location then the second one you have the gap and then that's inconsistent just be consistent it doesn't matter my second question is, we usually want the employer to notice like the experience related to the position. Mm -hmm. So I did an actuarial intention. I feel more comfortable highlighting that as my first work experience. Is it okay to do it or should I put my latest experience first? If you're going to do that, you need to have two sections. You need to have a relevant work experience and an additional work experience. Relevant work experience is the, is the work experience that's relevant to the field. Additional is just other work experience. So you can have two, two sections. Just put relevant, that one, and then additional, and the other ones. Because you don't want to mix them together. Because if you put, like, if you're going to do that and you want to highlight the, your internship because it's more relevant, but then you have ones down here and they're like, wait a minute, the dates aren't matching up. You don't want to do that because that's showing you don't have attention to detail. You want to separate them out into two different, and it's okay to have two different sections. Many people do. Okay. Uh -huh. Why should we include uh, a work experience that is not relevant at all to the job we are looking for? Let's say, for example, I work as a, wa as a waiter and mm -hmm. uh, I'm applying for an actuarial position. Mm -hmm. Why should I include that in my resume? To have a one-page resume. You don't, only, you don't want to have a half a page resume if you have work experience to fill the page. You want to be sure to fill the page. If you don't have the work experience, you have to fill a page. So if you have an actuary intern or a job or something, those are what's coming first. But if you still haven't filled that page, then you need to fill that with other work experience. So that's the only reason why. And as you gain experience, the, the serving jobs and the bartending jobs and the retail jobs will fall off of your resume. Some, some do's and don'ts. Um, whenever you're handing your resume to people, you want to be sure to have it printed on resume paper. Um, proofread beyond spell check. Um, mislabeling sections, past and present tense verbs. I saw a lot of past and present tense verbs on your resumes for jobs that you have present, you're using past tense verbs. For jobs that you had an end date, you're using present tense verbs. So be sure to check that. Spell check will not check that. By mislabeling sections, I mean putting something like volunteer experience on there and then putting a skill under there. That's totally different. Or labeling it skill section and putting one skill and the rest volunteer experience. That's mislabeling sections. And that's failure of attention to detail. If you're going to put volunteer experience, it needs to be under a section titled volunteer experience. Skills under skills. Relevant experience under relevant experience. Be sure that you're not labeling a section relevant experience if it's not relevant okay I see that a lot professional experience all the work any work experience you have is professional experience so you can label it professional experience but you don't want to label it relevant professional experience unless it's relevant okay revise your resume often that's just back to the point you're going to revise your resume with every job you apply to just keep that in mind be consistent with fonts and punctuation spell out acronyms Sometimes on resumes, you have acronyms that people do not know. If it's related to the field, okay, I'm sure that people know exactly what that means. But if it's not related to your field, you want to be sure to spell it out because they're not going to take the time to Google it to see what it is. So just be sure to spell that out. Um, spell out dates instead of using numbers. The reason is, be, depending on the font you use, when it opens up, sometimes the numbers can look kind of crazy. I know that sounds so ridiculous, but with people using all different um, versions of Word, it does open up kind of funky. So to just be on the, air, on the side of caution and just spell them out. And you can abbreviate them, like you can put DEC instead of spelling out December, but that's totally up to you. Okay, don't. Again, use pronouns. Don't use pronouns. Don't put the section at the bottom of your resume, references available upon request. That's a given. You want to save that for something, save that space for something else. If you use a section for relevant courses, don't put your course numbers on there. 
don't use colors other than black if I, um, I know I mentioned don't use templates if you do choose to use a template don't choose one that has colors just choose one that has black don't include your personal information so don't put your date of birth don't put your social security number <laughs> anything like that on there don't put your gender <laughs> anything like that on there now I'm also going to say I'm going to say that but I'm also going to say that some cultures require you to do it so if you're here and you're applying for a, a company that works internationally do your research because sometimes that that's the type of resume they want that was pointed out to me by a student who was applying to a German company and I told him I was like you need to pull this information off and he's like oh no 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 I've done done my research he sent me the link that's what they want so just be sure to know what type of organization you're working for now I won't say that but you know like coca-cola it's international they don't require you put personal information on it I'm talking about you know like for example like uh, BMW they do require you to put personal information on it so just know you know the types of organizations you're applying to um, I mentioned hobbies or interests like I said I tell students don't do it because of the types of things they put on there but if you want to do something like you pointed out to show you know that you're well-rounded and that you're involved in other things absolutely you can put it on there don't include it under skills put it under hobbies or interests don't include it under skills because that's not a skill okay be careful not to overuse italics italics is okay to use on your resume but some people use it too much don't you know if you're going to use it use it to just italicize your job titles or something like that don't italicize the name of your degree the name of the school all of your dates all of your job titles because when you open it up it's overbearing and if you use a small font you cannot read it okay pack information onto one page I mentioned that in the beginning um, just be sure you know I saw some some resumes had like a section over here then some information right here and it was another section don't do that make all your section titles down the left side of the page and put make sure that you have all your information going to this side don't have information over here center to the right things like that it's it's too busy and you're taking a chance that your resume will get passed on okay so once you're finished with your resume and you're you know looking everything over just ask yourself these questions is it relevant is it focused to the employer you're <coughs> applying to so keep that in mind the employer I'm applying to is it results focused should you take anything off that goes back to the repetitive thing that I mentioned to you if you list it once don't list it again and then hand it to someone else and have them look at it and just ask them if you were a recruiter give them the job description is this relevant and let them okay anybody have any questions mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you mentioned that you shouldn't use any color but black mm -hmm. if you print out the resume in color mm -hmm. you okay you want to use f like blue font or what are you saying like if i print this out in you know in coral it's, it's, it's blue it's blue yeah uh-huh is that okay or mm -mm. Mm -mm. it should be black it should be black um and the reason is because you want you don't want you want what the information on your resume to draw attention not the colors so if i open your resume and it's blue it's kind of like i'm not reading this I, I, I can't sort through all these colors so yeah just make sure that it's black or like you said I printed out gray mm -hmm. if you want to change those boxes the color to gray that's fine because I mean it's gray is a shade of black so that's fine and how about the resume paper you mean like the cotton it's just like um like cotton paper linen paper mm -hmm. if any um uh, place that sells paper Office Depot Staples, Walmart even has it, and it says resume paper on it, mm -hmm. and it's usually cream. Some is like an off-white, one of those colors. And they also sell the envelopes too, so if you want to get some of those as well. And if you print, and I didn't touch on cover letters because we're not talking about those, but if you print your resume on resume paper, print your cover letter on resume paper. Be sure that they match. Okay. Mm -hmm. How relevant are cover letters? Like, in which case do you use it? Um, cover letters if an employer wants it they're going to tell you they want it I encourage students to always include it and the reason is because 
you're highlighting, you can put, okay, I just said something about packing information on the one page. In a cover letter, you can use the I's, the me's, the my's. I'm qualified because. So you can go into more detail in a cover letter than you can in a resume. So I always say to use it, um, but you don't have to if it's not required. Uh -huh. I'll just find out if you need some sort of sponsorship from the company you're applying to. Do you have stated on your resume or you can? You should wait. That is an excellent question. Um, she asked about sponsorships. Um, I, I'm i going to say it's okay to put it on your resume. I have so many international students that put it on their resume. And the reason is because they've applied to jobs, they've been called in for an interview, and have gotten so excited about working for this company, and it made it to the last interview. They're in the third interview, and they mention it, and then it's like, oh, well, we can't do that. So, and they've been heartbroken. And they're like, I wasted all my time interviewing. So I do have students who put sponsor, you know, F1 student sponsorship required. On the other side of that, for those of you who don't need sponsorship, but, and this, please, and I don't mean this in any discriminatory way, but your name may indicate like that you're from another culture from another country, something like that, I highly encourage you to put permanent resident, U.S. citizen, something like that. Now, I know that you're probably looking at me like, what? But <laughs> the reason for that is what you're saying. An employer can look at that and say, this is an international student. I, I can't sponsor them, so I'm not looking at it. So, but if you don't need the sponsorship, you want them to see that. Where do you put it? Put it directly under your name. So then that way they can see it as soon as it's at the top of your resume. Because, again, like I said, you know, you want them to know I don't require sponsorship. But at the same time, if you do require it, also put it on there so that the employer's not wasting your time interviewing you and you could be interviewing for another company that would give you sponsorship. Mm -hmm. And um, like, where would you recommend we put it? Uh, if, you, if you need sponsorship, put it at the top in your heading where your name and everything is, just put it at the top. Or I have some students that just put it, um, like instead of skills, they put additional information at the bottom of their resume and they'll put like skills, like whatever skills they have, and then they'll put a bullet that says F1 student sponsorship required, or they'll put US citizen permanent resident, something like that. But I found it so, so sometimes it's hard to, from the recruiter's point of view, that they don't even distinguish what is a permanent resident. Because you have like, they don't understand what's permanent resident. So they could like, I mean, they ask like, do you need sponsorship? I'm a permanent resident. So, are you a yes citizen? No, I'm not a yes citizen. I mean, you get to do kind of like, but I do, what he said is like true because at some time, uh, a recruiter told like, when, I, when he realized that uh, because he was going through resumes and he found that the names are like something like international and the schools are international universities, he said, or where you should put your, you have a screen card or something like that, so that we can understand that. Yeah. I mean, you see yeah, that. Steve, yeah. When you, if you're presenting your resume to somebody personally, now electronically, there's no, you, you can't go into detail about what a permanent resident is, but if you are submitting it, you can say, I'm a person, person excuse me, permanent resident authorized to work in the United States. So then that way, be, it's, it's real strange to me that they wouldn't know what a permanent resident is if they're trained HR professionals. However, you're saying that that happens, so um, just let them know what a permanent resident is. It's okay to tell them that, you know, so then that way, you know, because they'll ask you, when, you know, when you go to career fairs or networking events, they'll ask you, do you need sponsorship? So if they can ask you that, then you have every right to say, you know, I'm a permanent resident uh, and I'm authorized to work in the United States. Mm -hmm. about sponsorship and um, in a case where maybe on your master's program you need an internship but you're not close to graduation mm -hmm. so when you're sending out your resume is it will it be is it necessary to put that you will need sponsorship even though you know you will need it later like is it bad to put it too early or should you wait when you like you're sending out resumes when it's close to graduation you can put it on there whenever um, and many programs um, they allow you to work an internship without sponsorship. You just can't be hired as a full-time employee until you get the sponsorship. So be sure to check into that. 
because you don't want to put it on there if it's not needed for you to work your internship because I know what well, and it also depends on your visa if it's J1 H1 F1 it all depends on all of that so um, just be sure to do some research prior to putting it on there because you may not need it for an internship you're just going to need it for a full-time job but when you do your research and you find out if the if the internship can possibly turn into a full-time job then that's when you would want to put it on there okay mm -hmm. do you recommend that uh, if you're trying to obtain a uh, internship mm -hmm. that you include a cover letter with yes. the intern okay. yes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there a set length for uh, the cover letter itself? Or Three paragraphs. Paragraph? Three paragraphs. Um, you want to, first paragraph is, your second paragraph is going to be the biggest because that's when you're going to talk about your knowledge, your skills, examples. There are so many different formats of cover letters, but, you know, you want it, the first paragraph is going to be very introductory, talking about, you know, I, I saw this position on blah, blah, blah. Um, I am quite based on my education in whatever you know list your degrees um, I'm sure I qualify for this position the second paragraph is where you're going to talk about your knowledge and qualifications so that's going to be a big paragraph it's going to be about 10 to 15 sentences in that paragraph the first paragraph is about three to four your last paragraph is about three to four so, yeah. but you don't you don't want it to be from top to bottom though stay away from that that's why I said the big the second paragraph is the biggest it's going to be about 10 to 15 sentences but um, you don't want to definitely don't want to go to two pages or anything like that. Mm -hmm. I can bring you all a, a, a sample cover letter tomorrow, so then you, you'll have it. Excuse me, um, I hear that most employers don't even have time to read cover letters. Okay. It's just a waste of time. Just tossing it to trash. Now that is true for some recruiters, but some recruiters check it and they want to check it for your spelling and grammar. Now, um, I actually just read an article on that last week. Um, that they check it because of the new the texting and all of this and they know that so many people rely on that type of language that now they want to make sure that you can spell and that you do know how to structure a sentence because in your resume you're not using sentences you're just using brief statements so they're using a cover letter to check your grammar punctuation and spelling so I can't tell you, you know, this company wants one, this company doesn't, but I, I did. I just wrote a blog post on that the other day that a recruiter from Microsoft said that he does want the cover letter. If he doesn't get a cover letter, he tosses resumes in the trash because he wants to know that even though they're a technology company and, you know, they support all social media platforms and texting and everything like that, they still want to be sure that they're hiring the right person. So. I don't, just like I said, I always say, you know, better to do it than not. If they're not going to read it, they're just going to flip it and go to your resume anyway. So better to have it than not have it, I always say. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Through my career center, usually if they need um, the cover letter, they ask they for ask it. They ask for it. Mm -hmm. What should I do in this game? Just say when they don't ask for it. I still do it? I would still do it because you're not hurting anything. Now, if they want it and you don't get it, then you're hurting yourself. But if they don't request it and you send it, you're not hurting anything at all. They're not going to not look at your resume because you submitted a cover letter. Now, they have required document and then uh -huh. optional. Op optional. Mm -hmm. If they have uh, a cover letter as optional but not required, is it good to do it? Mm -hmm. Yes. And the, and the reason that it's good to do it is to show them you've taken the extra step. So say you submit one and you don't, but it's optional. Me as a recruiter, I'm going to say, oh, he really took the time to do a cover letter. And some people use it as a form of elimination to see who is going to do it. Who's going? Because cover letters aren't easy to do. If anyone in here has ever done a cover letter, they're not easy to write. And for you to have taken the time to structure your cover letter to my position and submit it, I think that that's a wonderful thing. You know, and or I could get student B who was just click, 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 you know, apply, apply, apply to all of these positions and didn't do a cover letter. So to me, that's a step up. That's setting yourself apart. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's related to cover letters. Okay. I've been writing cover letters for like four months. Okay. I will never have somebody you know, go over it. The person says, like, I repeated my resume. You're repeating your resume? Yeah, pretty much the same scenario. Okay. 
Your cover letter is not a repeat of your resume. You're going into more detail about your resume. So say for example, you're, you have four jobs on your resume that are relevant. Cover letters are relevant, okay? So you have four jobs on your resume and one is only relevant one's your internship. You're only talking about your internship on your resume. I mean, excuse me, in your cover letter. You're talking more about your education because of the knowledge you've gained through your education because you can't really go into a lot of detail about what you've done in your education on your resume, but you can in your cover letter. And then you're talking about your internship. So you're not going to talk about the jobs that you've had that aren't relevant. So you're only focusing on the skills. That's why I said cover letters are difficult to write because you're going to need to read that job description and then tailor that cover letter to the specific job description. Um, it's just a wrap up. So you're just you expressing your interest in the position. Um, express your interest. You look forward to speaking with them and you want to detail your, um, I mean, you want to provide your name, I'm um, not your name, excuse me, your phone number and contact information. Okay. And, and you never want to sell yourself short. In the last paragraph, I see a lot. If you would like, I am a, no, 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 you're assertive. I look forward to speaking with you. I await your phone call. I will be expecting those types of things. You want to be very assertive in your cover letter. You don't want to kind of second guess yourself. Or in your first paragraph, I believe I meet your, no, I do meet your qualifications. You want to be very assertive. Mm -hmm. Now, can you be proactive in the sense that if you have the individual's email address and phone number, mm -hmm. say something to the extent that uh, I will be contacting mm -hmm. you absolutely in a week of, you know give them time to look at it. absolutely um, you can if you have their contact information you can say um, I will be contacting you on Wednesday August the 2nd 2012 at 12 p.m. you can let them know all of the details and then that way you know they know or you can say and I will email you as <laughs> your email address <laughs> I mean it, you can if they've given you the contact information definitely do that and then you and you can also say something like in the event we do I cannot reach you I can be reached at and still provide your contact information okay. anybody else okay well that's everything I have um, I will see you all tomorrow during lunch I'll bring a copy of the cover letter so that you all can have that example we have one that has the different paragraphs and what to include and then we have an example on the other side so I'll bring that in there if there's any questions that you all have you know that you want me to bring any other information to you tomorrow send me an email this evening or in the morning and I can bring it because my office is right downstairs and I'll be at work in the morning before I come up <laughs> Come talk with us. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you.